No problem. Okay. Hi. So today we're going to be talking about something different from classification, which we've been talking about uh, for quite a while. Today we're going to talk about ranking. And just to give you a bit of a road map, uh, after introducing uh, what ranking is as a problem, we'll talk about three different algorithms that you can use to solve ranking problems. We'll talk about a boosting style algorithm that allows you to combine a bunch of weak rankers together uh, to create an overall strong ranker. We'll talk about max margin ranking. And then, as I alluded to last time, we'll talk about a reduction to classification uh, that allows you to optimize uh, arbitrary uh, ranking metrics uh, like uh, area under the curve. And we'll talk about all of that. Uh, but first, what's ranking? So oftentimes, in a machine learning problem, you don't just want um, a single answer for a single x. It's not just that. Uh, the x's are observed uh, by themselves and you just want a single y as output. Instead, what you really want to do is you have a bunch of candidates and you want to rank them somehow. So you want to know of a bunch of examples which one is the best. And so uh, one thing that might come to mind is something like web search. Uh, you type in some query, uh, say you're looking for pictures of cats, uh, that goes off to Google, and then Google has a machine learning problem. It has billions or trillions of web pages, and it needs to rank them in some way that corresponds best to your query. How does it do that? Um, Another example could be you go on to Netflix and, uh, or Amazon, and they want to recommend uh, books or movies uh, for you to watch next. Again, that's a ranking problem. Uh, they want to be able to give you a long list of movies ranked in the order uh, that you would like to see them. Uh, another application is online dating sites. You have some profile um, and some properties and uh, OkCupid uh, or eHarmony wants to show you the profiles of all of the people that it thinks would be a good match for you. That again is a ranking problem. You have a bunch of examples and you need to order them in some way. So first, let's talk about rank boost. So uh, this was developed by some of the same folks who did the boosting algorithm uh, that we talked about for classification, and it's going to look fairly similar to the boosting algorithm that we talked about before. What's going to be a little bit different is that we're now going to talk about some function phi that is now uh, based on pairs of examples. And so uh, what we're going to look for is a feedback function that basically is positive if the uh, second argument is preferred to the first and uh, negative if the first argument is preferred to the second and then zero if there's no preference. And so you can easily see how this could create a rank afterwards. Um, you have a bunch of movies and uh, if you like uh, 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 Star Trek, uh, the motion picture, uh, more than uh, Michael Bay's Transformers, uh, then this should be a negative number. And, and then, given all of the movies, uh, you could figure out how to create the ranking out of that. And so remember, uh, from boosting, we had this distribution D uh, that told us which examples we needed to get right. Uh, so the examples that we had uh, made mistakes on in the past, um, in the future, we should get those right. Uh, we called that distribution D, and we're going to use something very similar this time. But instead of just taking a single example and creating a weighting over that, we're now going to take pairs of examples, and we'll weight those pairs of examples and create a distribution over that. So which pairs of examples is it important for our algorithm to get right? 
And then the goal, uh, just like for boosting, we tried to minimize the number of errors weighted by our distribution D. We're going to do exactly the same thing, except errors um, are not associated with a single observation. Now they're associated with a pair of observations. So we want uh, to have uh, our algorithm creating some final ranking H. And this H uh, should get the uh, relative ordering of the pairs under D correct. And we're going to do that by combining a bunch of weak rankers together. And we'll assume that these uh, weak rankers take the form of some mapping from, from our examples to the real numbers. And this could be different systems, uh, different users, or different feature sets. Um, uh, so just like in boosting, it doesn't really matter how you get this weak ranker just so long uh, as it's better than random chance. And then we'll combine those weak rankers into a final ranking of the same form uh, that maps your examples into the real numbers. And uh, we're going to uh, further uh, constrain uh, the weak rankers to be of the form. Either it returns uh, 1 uh, if uh, some value is greater than a threshold, uh, 0 if it's less than a threshold, uh, or some default value um, if that's not applicable. So like the, the feature isn't defined for this observation. And uh, there are some details that we won't go into. So how exactly do you find uh, the default value in the threshold? Uh, you can do a binary search over how much it improves the rankings implied by D. Um, but it's very similar to the problem of finding the best weak learner uh, for the binary boosting classification problem. And then the algorithm ends up taking a very similar form. You initialize your distribution over pairs, and then for each round of boosting, you choose a weak ranking, and then you get an alpha. We'll say more about what that alpha is in a second. Then you update the distribution based on whether uh, your weak ranker gets this pair right or not, whether uh, if in the final ranking, uh, it puts one above the other, and then it's weighted by D. And then like uh, binary boosting, uh, this will make uh, wrong things bigger and right things smaller. And then the final ranking will just add up all of the, the uh, weak rankers together, then that produces a real number, and then you just sort by that real number. Okay, so uh, what is this alpha? Alpha includes the importance of an individual weak learner, the weak ranker, uh, and it in general decreases over iteration. So just like uh, binary boosting. And so you can compute a quality, uh, sorry, a quantity called the discrepancy uh, that basically says how wrong are you getting things. Uh, and then that becomes your alpha value. So this is very much like the error epsilon that we had before. Uh, but uh, translated to rankings. And as R gets smaller, the weak learner will have a lower rate, a uh, lower weight, sorry. Um, and this works better than individual features or nearest neighbors, and uh, this is discussed a little bit more in the book. So this is a, a variant on boosting that we can use. Uh, now let's talk about a variant of support vector machines that we can also use for ranking. And so now we're going to assume that every example has some feature vector f of x. And what we want to do is we want to again map these to a real line. And we'll do that by taking the dot product of this feature vector um, with some uh, uh, vector w, and then we want to uh, break these up into levels or ranks uh, so that um, the, the, the various ranks where things are comparable within a rank uh, are separated well. And again, we can think about a margin type 
uh, style algorithm, uh, we have this mapping of data points onto this line uh, u of x, and we want to, um, given uh, groups of data that have the same rank, we want the gap between them on this line to be as far apart as possible. And uh, we won't go through uh, the algorithm to actually uh, do this, but uh, there are some nice tools such as SVM Lite that allow you uh, to find these rankings. Uh, and uh, we'll go through a little bit of how you can encode uh, your data into a form that can be used by these programs. And so for each uh, of these examples, uh, you have a rank, you have an ID for uh, your observation, and then lots of features. And each is a row, each example is a row in a text file. Um, so here uh, we have one query that corresponds uh, to a bunch of observations. And so uh, all of these here correspond to query one. And then you have um, uh, ranks one, two, and three, and then the features over here. And you can uh, encode your ranking problem in this way. And STM Lite, uh, there's a link uh, to this program on the course webpage, uh, will find the best ranking uh, given these data. Okay, finally, uh, the last uh, ranking algorithm that I want to talk about uh, is, again, a classification problem. Uh, so you're taking ranking and then reducing it to a classification problem. And so uh, the last two things that we've talked about uh, assume that all pairs of items are important. But that isn't always the case. Often we care about the top of the results list more than the bottom. Uh, one thing that Google quickly found out is that people, only if they're really desperate, go beyond, say, the first uh, two or three results. And often they only look at the first result. And uh, things like regression, as in the previous section when we were talking about um, uh, SVM style algorithms aren't that robust when there's one right answer and many wrong ones. It will spend a lot of its time trying to separate the wrong ones um, using arbitrary uh, distinctions. And so one way of getting um, a handle on this is using a different metric, a metric called area under the curve. <clears throat> and so imagine that there are two classes. There are winners and there are losers. Uh, things that are right and things that are wrong. And what we want is, is uh, a consecutive run of winners uh, before you get to any of the losers. Uh, so uh, this is good. Um, uh, this is less good, uh, but still not too bad. Uh, what's really bad is having all of the losers uh, followed by the winners. So you want the winners to come first, the losers to come second. Uh, and this is uh, what's encoded uh, by the area under the curve. Uh, one, the reason that it's called the area under the curve is that if you plot uh, true positive versus false positive, uh, you basically want curves that go all the way into this uh, region and give you the highest area under the curve. And so there's this really nice paper from uh, uh, John Langford and company um, that allows you to optimize this exactly, uh, except using a classifier. And so uh, the nice thing about this is that if you have some classifier uh, with regret R, uh, then the loss of this classifier is at most 2R. Uh, so uh, let's uh, uh, give an example of this to make this more clear. Uh, so if you have uh, a binary classification error of 20%, uh, 
uh, due to inherent noise and 5% due to errors made by the classifier, then the AUC regret when you turn it into this ranking problem is at most 10%. Uh, so um, it's based on how much the, uh, the regret uh, for the AUC is defined by how much error the classifier make makes and not by the inherent noise of your data. So this is a nice theoretical guarantee. And so the way that this works is that uh, you learn a classifier and you do this in the following way. Um, you take a random pair of examples and then you learn a classifier to predict uh, whether it should prefer the first to the second. So this is a lot like the preference function that we talked about uh, for boosting. And then you return this classifier C. And then uh, when it comes to form a ranking, uh, you basically run a tournament. And so given an example, uh, you count up uh, the number of times it beat other examples. And then you sort uh, all of those examples based, by, based on the number of pairwise uh, classifications that it won. Now, for a really large list, this becomes unacceptable because you have complexity n squared at test time. Uh, but you can use a variant of quick sort where you uh, uh, randomly select a pivot and then you take all of your data and then you, you say that some are greater and some are less and then you recurse on those two sets and then break it down until you get a total sort. Um, and so this actually gives you the same regret performance, uh, but it's a randomized algorithm. Uh, there are some details that, that we're not talking about. So balancing positive and negative classes. It also requires cross-validation uh, to try out some of these options. Um, and weighting the positive cases is really important because those are, those are the things that you want to get right. Um, so uh, you, you need to make sure that your classifier allows you to weight examples. Okay, so uh, today we talked about ranking. Uh, it's an important problem that's used in a variety of settings, uh, especially in uh, online uh, commerce and in social networks and recommendation systems. Uh, we talked about uh, a couple of different approaches at a high level where you can combine weak rankers, uh, you can use a max margin function, uh, or you can do a tournament classification reducing the problem to one of binary classification. So that's it uh, for ranking and uh, next time we'll talk about a very different problem, uh, regression, where we're trying to predict a real number uh, for our data. And uh, even though uh, instead of having a list, you're outputting a real number, uh, it's uh, connected at a theoretical level because many of the techniques that we talked about today uh, end up producing a number, uh, the number of matches that an example won, um, the dot product of an example uh, with uh, your uh, classifier uh, parameters and then sorting your data by this. So uh, many of the things that we'll talk about in regression uh, can also be carried back to the ranking problem. So that's what we'll talk about next time. Okay, uh, end of session two.